Hi everyone, Ross Porter here. With us is a pioneer in several areas of her life. We can talk about women's basketball. We can talk about sports announcing. We can also mention that she and her husband, Don Drysdale, the first husband wife ever to be in separate halls of fame in their sports careers. And I can't tell you how pleased I am today to have my good friend, Annie Myers Drysdale as our guest. Oh, thanks, Ross. I love you and Lynn and your family. And, uh, you know, you and Donnie were so close when you worked with the Dodgers together. And it just those are special times. And uh, anytime I can talk to you and Lynn, it's, it's always special. Thank you, dear. Well, I found out something new about you as I began <laughs> my preparation. Your middle name is Elizabeth. Correct. My mother's first name was Elizabeth. Ah, so, ah. that's wonderful. Okay. Good name. Um, let's start with your family. And boy, was it an athletic family. <laughs> you were the sixth of 11 children, six girls and five boys. And your dad was a good basketball player at Marquette University in Milwaukee and later with the Milwaukee Shooting Stars. So he got it all started, didn't he? I guess so. And uh, he was an only child. My mom came from a family of eight. And, uh, but they both grew up in Wisconsin. And uh, dad played basketball at Marquette. He was the captain of the 1945 team. They moved out to San Diego when they got married. And uh, dad played AAU ball after that. Um, but certainly, uh, yeah, being in sports and a big family, it, it really meshed well together. The oldest child in your family, Sister Patty, was on the 1970 Women's Collegiate National Championship team at Cal State Fullerton. Then she played professional softball. Then she came back and later was the head basketball coach at Pepperdine University for seven years. Her teams averaged 21 victories a year. She won almost 70% of her games. And that's still the best winning percentage in Pepperdine history. But the shame of it all is she is not in the Pepperdine Hall of Fame. Yeah, I don't know what's holding that back, but I will tell you that Patty was probably the, uh, she was the ultimate competitor. And people talked about the way my brother David played and the way I played. I was just a miniature uh, version of David, but you know, we all went off Patty. I mean, Patty's intensity in playing sports was incredible. And uh, my two older brothers, Tom and Mark, and Mark, uh, he had a football scholarship at Cal. And, you know, we all played with that, that same kind of intensity when we played sports. But, you know, Patty was a wonderful role model for me as far as athletics. And uh, when I was in fourth grade, I read a book on Babe Diedrichson's Zaharias, and that really gave me the dream to go to the Olympics. But you know, playing sports was nothing different for me because I saw Patty doing it all sure. the time. And I saw women of, you know, her age competing in sports, whether it's softball or volleyball or basketball, whatever. And so when I, I, I'm sad, honestly, and, and have to laugh when I hear young athletes today saying, well, we didn't have a role model. Um, and I'm thinking, wow, there have been plenty of women that have been out there way before Title IX playing sports. And uh, for young women to say that, um, that's just not making the effort to understand who is uh, Althea Gibson, you know, the great tennis and golfer, first African-American woman to play those sports. And then Wilma Rudolph and Wyoming Atias, and let alone Billie Jean King. But, you know, there's some, been some great athletes uh, in all sports that these young women need to know who they were. And, and Patty really introduced me to that. Didn't you and Patty play together on an AAU team one time? We did. I was uh, eight years younger than Patty. And I think I first played with her on an AAU team when I was 13. And um, so, you know, she showed me the ropes. But boy, you did not want to mess with Patty. I, you know, we talk about her sports and her, her athleticism, but um, she would come home from a softball game. And in those days, back in the 60s and 70s, they played in shorts. And yeah. those games would go 20 something innings and they'd be one nothing games. And you know, she played against Joan Joyce and Shirley Topley, and, and uh, she'd come home with these raw raspberries on her thighs from sliding, and she wouldn't say a thing. And, uh, but we'd have to go wake her up from, you know, mom wanted us to go wake her up, and we'd go, Patty, Patty, it's time to get up. We'd whisper, because boy, when she woke up and it was one of us, she chased us down, and it was not pleasant. 
Your brother, David, was an All-America basketball player at UCLA. He was an outstanding player. He played on two national championship teams over there for John Wooden. He was the second player taken in the NBA draft one year by the Milwaukee Bucks. And he played with them for four years. And then he decided he'd go another route. But before he got out of the NBA, he scored 32 points one night against the Portland Trailblazers. And I'll bet you and the family were thrilled when Milwaukee won the NBA championship this year, weren't you? Well, come on, Ross, that's a double-edged sword for me. I work for the Phoenix Suns and Mercury. <laughs> that's right. And so um, definitely I was pulling for the Phoenix Suns, but if it was any opponent that it had to be Milwaukee, um, certainly there's and still some people that work with the Bucks that are still there when David played. And uh, so very happy for them. But I know, too, that the Phoenix Suns will be back. Uh, I know that it's a, a bitter taste when you lose like that, but it also drives you. And it's fascinating looking at the polls for next year. Phoenix isn't even mentioned in the top 10. Mm. And, uh, you know, it's the Lakers, it's Brooklyn, it's Philly. Mm. It's, you know, but uh, they don't mention Phoenix at all. They mention Milwaukee. But um, yeah, we certainly were happy for Milwaukee. We still have family that live back there. And uh, but uh, I was pulling for the Suns all the way. Uh, yeah, of course, that was Milwaukee's first championship in 50 years. Went all the way back to a guy named Lou Alcindor. <laughs> and Oscar Robertson. But it was funny when David was with the Bucks, uh, they had gotten um, Bob Lanier. And uh, Bob Lanier, every time I'd see him, uh, he would be so mad at me. He said, your brother cost me a championship. And uh, when David retired, uh, it was a Milwaukee team that probably had a great chance of winning the NBA championship, as difficult as it is. And that was in 1984, 85. And uh, but or 1980, I should say. But in saying that, um, you know, David was a, a glue guy. I mean, he his intensity, his hustle, his couple of nicknames were Spider. Uh, and the other one was Crash because he was always on the ground. He was fighting. And Marcus Johnson, who was on the team and played with him at UCLA, talked about his his uh, leadership in the sense of, you know, he set picks. He screened out. He got rebounds. He did all the little things. He could play defense on any player in the league. And, um, you know, he was just, he wanted, you know, kind of like a Bobby Jones kind of player. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but yeah, a lot of them missed David when, when he retired. And uh, um, it was, it was tough for all of us because we loved watching him play. He, well, uh, he was fun to watch. That was a short career, but I think he wanted to spend more time with his family, didn't he? He did. He did. And uh, he got to see his children grow up and, he became very involved with his church. We grew up Catholic and he became a Jehovah Witness. Uh, Elvin, um, uh, uh, Lenny, not, is it Lenny Elmore? No, not Lenny Elmore, but um, Elmore Smith uh, was in that trade. There were four guys that went to Milwaukee from LA to bring Kareem to LA. And that was uh, Brian Winters, uh, Junior Bridgman, Elmore Smith and David. And Elmore Smith was a Jehovah Witness and uh, was able to get David into that um, and uh, David wanted to spend more time with his family and see them grow up. He had a couple injuries that that he wasn't happy with the club, how the club had uh, the ball club had handled his injuries. And uh, um, uh, they just, you know, it was, it was tough. It was a tough time. And uh, but he came back to California and he was able to, um, you know, he became a teacher. He was an educator like Coach John Wooden, which along the way you'll ask about him. But I call him Papa. And uh, but Papa was very influential in David's life and and all of our lives, even your life, because you said when you used to practice, you might go in the, the men's coach's room and just chat with him for a while after practice. Right. <laughs> well, the, the, when I was a freshman, David was a senior and being the first woman to get an athletic scholarship at UCLA was big because uh, David had come home one weekend when I was in high school and his uh, roommate uh, that he lived in an apartment with was Kenny Washington. And Kenny had been on Coach Wooden's first championship teams, and Wash was the, the coach of the women's team. So they came home one day and said, how would you like to go to UCLA on an athletic scholarship? And I said, well, of course. Who, I, you know, I couldn't afford that. But um, that's how I got my scholarship with Wash coming home one weekend for a barbecue with David. Wow. And, uh, but he was my freshman coach, and, and Papa would be watching practices, which we had no idea that he was watching practices. We usually practiced in the women's gym. Or when we practiced at Poly, they had a JV court at the time. And uh, so when the varsity would practice, we would practice a half hour after them. 
but I would get done with my classes and Papa would allow me to come watch practices. And uh, most practices were closed for UCLA. And, but he would let me watch because David and, uh, you know, it was just, we did the same thing as a freshman. I mean, the, the fundamentals, the repetition, same drills day in and day out. Certainly he would do other things that he was stressed. Never talked about winning, never talked about losing, um, but just to being the best that you can be. And uh, certainly it was a, a, a wonderful time to be a freshman at UCLA. Your wonderful mother, Pat, is 96 years old. Does she know the Bucks won the NBA this year? <laughs> we've told her, we've told her, and she'll smile. Um, she does have dementia and uh, is in a bed 24 seven, but you know, we go visit her and we let her know and we've got the, the sports on the Olympics are going on now. And so she's got those on and um, you know, it's unfortunate that she can't communicate like I'm sure that she would, but uh, there was a smile on her face. <laughs> now I want to back up a little bit because for people who don't know, you were vice president, not only of the, uh, the Mercury, the women's team in Phoenix, but I think also you had the title with the, with the, uh, the, the men's basketball team too, right? The Suns? Correct. I, I joined uh, Phoenix Suns and Mercury in, in 2007, and I had been working for ESPN. I think I was in my 26th year with them. And uh, Robert Sarver, who was the new owner of the Phoenix Suns, approached me about coming to join the, uh, the organization and becoming the general manager for the Phoenix Mercury, uh, which was a, you know, it was a bold step. And uh, certainly I've been offered a lot of jobs uh, after Donnie passed away and uh, I had to turn them down. But my, my children were older and I felt it was the right time. It was the right opportunity. And, uh, and Phoenix wasn't that far from California. So I took the GM job and I was fortunate enough to be in a position where the women, the Mercury won two WNBA championships. And then uh, they asked me to step aside and, and get into community relations and broadcasting. So I broadcast for both teams too. And do a lot of PR work for them. And, and uh, the Mercury won their third WNBA championship in 2014. So I've been fortunate to be with a, a very good organization. Yeah, you were the GM when they won it in 2007 and 2009. All right. I want now to go to a little bit more personal conversation with you, to talk to you, a four-time All-America basketball player at UCLA, the first female to ever sign a contract with an NBA team, inducted into so many halls of fame that I just gave up counting them a couple of years ago. <laughs> but uh, a look at the life of a young Ann Myers. First of all, when did you become Annie? Oh, I think always. I mean, my family has always called me Annie. <laughs> But in the press, you were never Annie, were you? You were always Ann Myers Drysdale. I don't know. You know, you said my middle name is Elizabeth, and and I spell my name Ann A N N. And uh, because my middle name was Elizabeth, a lot of the press would write my name A N N E. Hmm. And uh, so, and a lot of people assume that's how you spell Annie. Hmm. And uh, so, I think a lot of that was through that. Is it true that basketball was not your first love when you were a youngster? What, what sports did you go to first? Well, probably football. That's what my brothers played. We were huge Green Bay Packer fans, which we still are. And, uh, you know, Bart Starr and Ray Nitschke and, you know, that generation of Vince Lombardi. We had Vince Lombardi all over the house. Yeah, but I'm talking about you as a competitor. Uh, Yes, it was football. I'd go out and play football with my brothers in the street right. and up in the what playgrounds at school. I, but you know, the only organized sports for girls at that age basically was swimming and track and field. So, yeah. you know, track and field is the one that I went to, and especially right. reading a book on Babe Dietrichson. And uh, so I was a high jumper, and then I became a, a pentathlete. They didn't have the heptathlon then. And, um, but I was, uh, track and field became my go-to, I think, when I was in fourth grade as an organized sports. And uh, I don't know how my mom did it, you know, with all those children and driving us all around. I know that I was very active with the, the um, track team that I was on. It was over the hill in, in West Covina, and she'd have to drive me and then wait for me or come back and pick me up or pick somebody else up. And hmm. I mean, I mean, talk about a, a taxi service. Uh, I don't know how my mom did it, but she was able to drive all of us around. You were on the boys' basketball team, I think, in the fifth and sixth grades. How did you fare? <laughs> 
Well, remember, what was it, 1965 or 66, when the uh, John Kennedy, President John Kennedy, put the president's um, physical fitness yeah, right. thing out? One, with yeah, all no. the... he, he was assassinated in 1963, so it had to be earlier. So, than... so in 62 or 63, he put that out. Okay. And so that was in all the elementary schools. So that was a really kind of the first time for me in school that I could compete against the boys doing pull-ups and sit-ups and broad right. jump and running the 50 yard dash and softball throw. And so, you know, it was a chance where I could compete against the boys and kind of show my stuff because um, I did it with my brothers all the time, but this was school. And then in fifth grade, they had an after school sports program and it was only for boys. So unbeknownst to me, because I had played basketball my whole life, even going through fifth grade, that um, my mom and dad had gone to the school district, had gone to the school, had gone to the principal, had to get it okay through the PTA, that it was okay for me to play basketball with the boys after school. And so that's kind of how that came about because it was offered to the boys, but not the girls. And when I was growing up, uh, girls wore skirts and dresses to school. Um, so I always wore shorts underneath my skirt so I could go out and play basketball or kick the ball or you know, just play sports at recess. So there were no co-ed teams throughout your junior high school year, were there? You, you had to wait until high school to do what you wanted? Well, it, it was interesting. I, I mean, I played sports in, in uh, junior high. They had girls sports. And, uh, but it was interesting because, um, you know, once I went to junior high, I would go out at recess and play boys basketball mm -hmm. at, at uh, lunchtime. And not only in elementary school, when I was playing football at recess one time, uh, I had a teacher come up and say, well, that's not ladylike. And I didn't understand that because I'd always played sports. And then when it was lunchtime at junior high, uh, I had a teacher say, well, you can't play with the boys. That's you know, not ladylike. And I didn't. What's the big deal? <laughs> and uh, so it's interesting how you came up against those. And, and I didn't understand it because, again, in our family, it was OK for girls and boys to play sports. Yeah. Well, from there you went on and you became an outstanding player. You moved into high school. Uh, you were not only um, MVP your freshman year, but it was also sophomore, junior, senior years. Uh, I, and as a senior, I think you were the first high school player to be selected for the U.S. national girls team, weren't you? I was. And, and high school was fun. I mean, I played seven different sports. Wow. And, and you think about, you know, the track and field was still important to me in, in elementary school and junior high. And I went to the Junior Olympics, hoping to go to the 1972 Olympics as a high jumper. Um, mm -hmm. I went to the Junior Olympics, but uh, I did not qualify. But uh, yeah, I think I finished second or third or something like that. But, you know, it just gave me hope about competing for the United States and going to the Olympics. Um, so I was traveling around the, the state. I never went out of country, I mean, or out of, out of state. And certainly we couldn't afford it either. Uh, just the fact that I was on a track team was big because with all the kids, I mean, my mom and dad didn't have a lot of money to join a lot of clubs. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but certainly I think, you know, David in high school, we didn't play outside club basketball or track or soccer, whatever it was. Uh, they really didn't have it. We just played high school stuff. Mm -hmm. So between my junior and senior year in high school, I had played on the boys varsity basketball team in the summer leagues. And I'd always played against those guys growing up and going down to our high school in, in the gym or on the, um, we were playing pickup games in the park or whatever. And so I thought that I was going to play varsity basketball during the school year. But, you know, when you're in high school, people have a tendency to say a lot of things about you. You're maturing, you're changing physically and emotionally and mentally. So I had a lot of people talk me out of it. And so I thought, okay, I'll go play on the girls basketball team and I'll be able to do field hockey or volleyball or badminton or some of the other sports that I played. And, uh, and then I was asked to join the USA team. I was asked to try out for it and I made it. And uh, so for me, not making that boys team gave me the opportunity to make the USA team as a high school player. What was your scoring average in high school? I have no idea. idea. <laughs> I have no idea. All right. Did you seriously consider, despite Kenny Washington's visit, 
ever going anywhere else but UCLA? Yeah, I mean, I had no idea where I was going to go. I had uh, my sister Patty and Tom had gone to Cal State Fullerton. Mark went to uh, Cal on a football scholarship. Kathy went to FJC, and uh, which Patty did too, uh, Fullerton Junior College. And then uh, she ended up going to UCLA. David was at UCLA. Um, I just figured, you know, I was going to go to Fullerton. I mean, I, I had no idea. It didn't cost a lot of money at that time in the 70s and had no idea what Title IX was as of yet. And uh, so when, you, when David and, and Wash came home that weekend and said, you can go to UCLA on a basketball scholarship, I'm like, yeah, it took a lot of pressure off my mom and dad. And then there yeah, were five more behind me that had to I go would, to school. I'd be thinking they'd be knocking on your door or other schools to offer you other scholarships. Well, again, it wasn't like that, Ross. I mean, women, the sports was just changing for women. There was not a lot of money in, uh, in the colleges at that time, and certainly for the, the women's programs. And it was more still an intramural type thing. So yeah. 75 was, really, even though it, the law was passed in 72, you know, 75 was when things started to change. And I was just fortunate enough to come along at the right time and uh, be in the right place and where my brother was. John Wooden, whom you were very close to, once said that you were the reason that women's sports took the jump that it did. That's a nice compliment. Huge, huge compliment, because I agree. Uh, if I go anywhere else, whether I go to Cal State Fullerton or some of those AAU teams like Wayland Baptist College, Myself or women's basketball does not get the notoriety it does. And along coming along at the same time when Title IX was because David was there. I came and it was a human interest story that the media took off on. You were one of them working for NBC. And I remember you coming to the house and yeah. uh, mom is there and all his kids are gathered around her. Ross Porter is here. He's a broadcaster on NBC. We get to see him nightly and on the sports news and everything. You're big time, Ross. What was, and, the, uh, what was the reason I came out? Were you or Dave, no, was David. honored for something? It was absolutely David, as always David, which was great. I think uh, when I was in high school, I was intimidated by that. I was Dave Meyer's little sister. And, you know, I really had a complex about that. But uh, once I got back uh, to Sonora High School, I, I was proud to be his little sister, especially at UCLA. But, you know, going back to what Papa said, I mean, the media attention, especially in a market like Los Angeles, Women's basketball myself does not receive that kind of attention unless I'm not at UCLA with my brother David, with Papa there, UCLA winning national championships, him giving women's basketball credibility and, and myself. So that, you know, that stood for a lot. And I go anywhere else in the country. Nobody knows who I am. But L.A. was a big market. And uh, fortunately, David and I had good years his senior year, my freshman year. Ann Myers, folks, was the first woman to receive a full basketball scholarship from UCLA, which made national news. And from there, you were the only freshman on that team in 1975. You led the Bruins in scoring, rebounding, and assists. All four years at Westwood, you made the All-American team. And this is, this is really something to really remember about Ann Myers. She was the first four-time college All-American, male or female. You had to be as proud of that as anything. Well, again, I, I feel fortunate to come along when I did because Kodak was a sponsor that got involved with women's basketball in 1975. And so they didn't really have any All-American titles for women in basketball or volleyball or track or swimming or any of those in college. And so for Kodak to come in and start it in 1975, uh, I was very fortunate. And as you well know, David's freshman year, which was what, 72, yeah. three, four, five, or 71, was the last year they had the freshman rule in college sports for men. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the timing was right for me. And I was fortunate. As a matter of fact, my senior year, even though I left the school holding 12 of the 13 records, um, my senior year when we won the national championship, I was the third leading scorer on that team behind Denise Curry and Anita Ortega. Mm. And Denise Curry, to this day, who was a two-time Olympian, and uh, she is the all-time leading scorer at UCLA, not Don McClain, 
Hmm. Denise Curry is. And that's when we had no three point shot and the women played with the regular size ball. And uh, so Don McLean is the all time leading scorer for men at UCLA, right. but Denise Curry is the all time leading scorer for both men and women. And um, she was a remarkable player, but uh, even though I was the third leading scorer, I think I led the team in assists and rebounds, blocks, all that deals. Yeah. So your team won the national championship as a senior, and you were named Player of the Year in college women's basketball. In fact, your number fifteen jersey was retired and was placed in the Basketball Hall of Fame. Do you ever go by and see it? <laughs> Every now and then, I tell you what was a special was the night that they retired my number along with Denise Curry and our coach Billy Moore was there, but Papa was there because they also retired Bill Walton and Lou Alcindor, I should say Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And uh, so the four of us had our numbers retired that same night. And I had just had my second child, Darren. Uh, DJ, I think was two at the time, Don Jr. And uh, Darren was just born. But it was the first time that my husband, Don Drysdale, had been at Poly Pavilion all wow. those years oh. being in Southern California and playing for the Dodgers. And it was the first time he was ever on the UCLA campus and at Poly. So, um, you know, I was very proud and excited and, and humbled by not only Donnie being there and my children, but uh, just being amongst with Denise and, and Bill and, and uh, Kareem. Going back to that year, one of the things that you really wanted to accomplish before you left was to win a national championship. And sure enough, you did. You beat Maryland in the finals, 90 to 74. Uh, you had a little bit to do with that championship game. You scored 20 points. You grabbed 10 rebounds. You made nine assists. And you stole the ball eight times. Other than that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was. We finally it was, got it. We finally got, the we finally got it. And it was at UCLA. And what separated it, too, one, it was my birthday. And so my family was there and it was at Poly Pavilion, but it was the first time it was a final four for the women's basketball finals. And also it was the first time that you had two big name universities because yeah. Immaculata had won it three years in a row. Delta State had won it three years in a row. So those were smaller schools and probably didn't get the recognition they deserved, but, um, and they had wonderful players starting Delta State with Lucia Harris was one of the best centers in the, in the country and our starting center on the Olympic team. But um, UCLA and Maryland, that drew a lot of attention. And a lot of it too, because we had played Maryland and North Carolina State early in the season, uh, the women did. And so we received a lot of recognition because my brother David, his senior year, when they played Maryland, uh, Lefty Drizel's team, they had beaten Maryland. And then when they played NC State with David Thompson, they beat him once and then lost in the final four. And uh, but Dave Myers name kept coming up, Dave Myers, Dave Myers. So now it was Dave Myers, little sister was coming to play in those two places. So uh, there was a lot of a lot of exposure, a lot of interest. And we lost those two games early in the season. And uh, certainly to go undefeated after losing three early on was huge. And to be at Poly Pavilion, my family, my birthday, uh, playing with what, such wonderful players and uh, beating Maryland, who they had beaten us early on, was, was a big plus. Let's move to 1976. That was a special year for you. You were a member of the U.S. Women's Olympic basketball team. Uh, I remember you telling me way back then that it was very uncertain that the U.S could even send a women's team to Montreal to the games to perform. But I didn't learn until a couple of nights ago that you had to be in the top eight nations to be invited to Montreal. And so the U.S. was out of it. And they said, OK, we'll take two more teams, but they've got to win five straight games in what you'd see, I guess, would call qualifying. Mm -hmm. And you won all five of them. Uh, went to on to uh, Montreal and won the silver medal. The Soviet Union got the gold. But didn't you tell me that because uh, there was no government subsidy or something that you were out, you were out raising money to have the women even go? Absolutely. We were all trying to raise money to one, go to the, um, the uh, uh, tryouts and certainly being on in 1975, which I was a freshman, we, I was on the Pan Am team. And that Pan Am team won gold. 
But then we went to the world championships in Cali, Colombia. And I think to myself how blessed I am to be able to travel the world because of this wonderful game that has you know, influenced my life. But we go to Cali, Colombia for the world championships. Now, 1976 was going to be the first year that they were going to allow women's basketball in the Olympics. And you think back, what was it, 1932 or 36 when they had men's basketball? So mm. how many years later they finally have women's basketball? But they were only taking six teams. And so you had to finish in the top three in the world championships. We finished eighth. And the Soviet units, the Soviet unit finished uh, first, uh, Czechoslovakia and Japan. And those were the top three qualifiers. So Canada was an automatic qualifier because they were the host country. So we went to this qualifying tournament. We didn't, we didn't even know if we were going to get in. Um, so the majority of us, we had to raise money to get to one, the tryouts. And then if we got to the tryouts, then ABA USA, which is now called USA Basketball, uh, that was the governing body of, of uh, USA Basketball was ABA USA. And so there was not money set aside for the women. It was for the men because the 76, they were making a changeover because the 72, the um, gold medal was awarded to the Russians, not the Americans, which again, the Americans that were on that team still have not and will not receive that silver medal because they were robbed mm -hmm. of what three chances the, um, the yeah. Soviet yeah. Union got. And yeah. anyway, so they made a change on the men's side. Dean Smith became the men's coach and he brought four of his players Walter Davis, Phil Ford, Mitch Kupchak, and uh, Tom Lagarde, and they had Adrian Dantley and Scott uh, Scott uh, what's uh, from Indiana and May. This, Scott May, thank you. Um, you know, and they had a terrific team. They, so everything was put into the men's side, and and they won gold, but they didn't even think the women were going to qualify and go. And so even though we did qualify, finally we one we had to go through the tryouts, we had to make the team, we went through practices. And uh, once we got to uh, um, Hamilton, Ontario, qualified, there was no place for us to go because you couldn't go to the Olympics yet. So, um, I, or maybe it was before, before we got to Hamilton. So they had nowhere for us to go. We went to Rochester, New York, stayed at the University of Rochester in dorms that were being renovated. So there was no air conditioning or anything. And a lot of that had to do with Kodak. And uh, so they let us stay in those dorms and Bill Wall, who was the head of ABA US at the time, he used his credit card of $500 to get us to travel and to be able to not only get to a qualifying tournament in Hamilton and, and win that, we beat Bulgaria. So we were the next two teams to go to, um, to, go to Montreal, but his $500 helped carry us through so we could get to Montreal. Wow. Well, let's see now. Um... 1978, uh, you become the top overall pick in the formation of the Women's Basketball League. You signed with New Jersey. No, and, no, 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 no. See, you can't believe everything you read. Um, the Women's Professional Basketball League called the WBL. I was the number one draft pick by the Houston Angels. Oh, and I did not play that first year because I wanted to graduate and I wanted to stay amateur for the 1980 Olympics. And in the interim of that year, they traded my rights to the New Jersey Gems. Yeah. And you averaged 22 points for them. But, and I think you were the co MVP of the league that year, but you didn't last long there, did you? <laughs> well, I didn't play the first year because that was, I, as I said, I wanted to stay amateur and get my degree. And which I got my degree and I stayed amateur and we went to the world championships. We won gold in 79 and uh, we went to the Pan Am games and we went to the Sparty kid games in Russia. And then we were getting ready to go to the world university games. And when we came back from Russia, I had gotten a call from Sam Nassi, the new India uh, owner of the Indiana Pacers. My brother, David was already in the NBA playing with the bucks. I knew a lot of guys in the NBA and uh, but certainly this was an offer that would, I would lose my amateur status if I went with the NBA and uh, the WBL was saying, well, she's not good enough. She's too old. The game has passed her by. I think I was 24 years old and they were saying all this, but um, I, I chose to go into the NBA. And so I did not play in the WBL the first year. And then the second year of the league is when I went in after I did not make it into the, in, uh, with the Pacers, I went into the WBL with the, New Jersey Gems, 
then played my first year, the second year of the league, and sat out the third year because they didn't pay me all my money. Mm. And also in that interim, when I signed with the Pacers, I had also signed a contract with, uh, with um, ABC to compete in the women's superstars. Yeah. So when I went to the WBL and the gyms, we were in the middle of our season, but there was some time off. I don't think I missed a game, but there was time off and I had to go down to the Bahamas and compete in the women's superstars, which again, playing in seven sports in high school for at UCLA, I thought oh, I'm a pretty good athlete. But when you're in the sun and have been indoor playing basketball, and then you go to the sun in the Bahamas, it's completely different. I finished fourth. I was not happy about it. But the one positive thing that happened is I met Don. Bob Euchre and Don Drysdale were broadcasting the women's superstars. And, and um, you know, he became such an important part of my life. And so even though I didn't play in the WBL that third year, um, and then the league folded. And so I trained to compete for the women's superstars. And then I won that three years in a row. And I was the only woman to compete in the men's superstars. They invited me to that. Well, 1979, was that the year that you were on the UCLA track team and they won the national championship? No, that was my freshman year in 1975. Was it? Yes. And what, high jumper? I was a high jumper and pentathlete. How high did you go? Oh, gosh. I had just learned how to do the flop. I had always rolled. The five and, uh, I'm trying to think, you know, when, when I got, you know, I, as I said, Babe Diedrichson was a, uh, a track athlete and also did the high jump. Um, but all, I cannot think of his name now, Beresnoff or something. He was uh, the Russian high jumper. But everybody did the roll then. Nobody, you know, it was all sawdust pits. Fosbury, and uh, so Fosbury, Fosbury was at Oregon. Well, Fosbury State. didn't come in until later because until they started having foam pits, mm. he didn't do it on sawdust. Mm. And uh, so, and as a matter of fact, I went into the Pac-12 Hall of Fame with uh, Dick Fosbury and had a wonderful uh, conversation with him, which I loved. And uh, it's a great sense of humor. I also went in with Ronnie Lott, which I sit on his uh, Ronnie Lott board of uh, impact award. But uh, getting back to the high jump, I learned how to flop by uh, Tom Telez and Jim Bush. They were mm -hmm. the men's coaches. Mm -hmm. And so the men's department, the athletic department kind of took me under their wing my yeah. freshman year. Gary Cunningham was huge in, in getting my grades and getting my uh, classes and so forth. So they coordinated practices. And, uh, but Tom Telez, who went to Houston and, and ended up coaching Carl Lewis and so forth, he had been at UCLA under Jim Bush. And mm. Jim Bush, I adore. I mean, he has some unbelievable track wow. athletes. And, and those, those track meets between SC and UCLA, they were, they were classics. They were classics. And uh, so I was my freshman year, I did um, track and field. And then my junior and senior year, I did uh, volleyball. And then I tried out for the tennis team, but um, it was, I was a fifth year <laughs> tennis player. And I played a little rugby, but the athletic director said, no, I don't want you playing rugby. <laughs> oh my <laughs> so I just, you know, I just love doing anything. I've only heard of one athlete who was in more sports than yours. Jim Thorpe played in 13 different sports and he was the national junior ballet dancing champion. <laughs> he was special. He was special. And Jackie Robinson at UCLA. Oh yeah. Yeah, Jack yeah. did four sports at UCLA. Well, you graduated from UCLA with a bachelor's degree in sociology. How'd you choose sociology? Well, I, I came in wanting to be undecided. I had no idea what school was about on the college level. And, and UCLA is tough because it's on the quarter system. And uh, I think David was a history major. But um, yeah, I got into sociology. It just it, the, the classes, not that they were easier, but they were more interesting, that's for sure. But I needed two extra quarters to graduate. And so that last year when we won the championship at UCLA, and even though I was drafted and so forth, I had two more um, uh, quarters to go. And so one of the classes I ended up taking was a sports broadcasting class. And Art Friedman was a professor, and, and I had a friend talk me into taking that class, but we just hit it off. He knew how to connect with me. And even as a senior, Ross, you knew you you had interviewed me. I was not a good interview. I did not like. I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that but I do remember you and I did a, a UCLA men's game at Berkeley That's right. one night, didn't we? But that was after I took that class. That huh. was after I took that class, and I was I was intimidated to be in front of the camera. I did not like talking to people. I had met Tom Harmon while I was at UCLA, 
-hmm. And Tom was, uh, he would talk to me about broadcasting. And, uh, and then when I took this class, it helped me decide that it was like, gosh, I, can I really do something like this? And, yeah. uh, and then you, I got to work that UCLA game with you and I uh, got to meet Ted Dawson and different people in the sports area of UCLA, uh, of Los Angeles. And, um, you know, it just kind of took off. I still was not good. I, I was fortunate enough I to get a job at you well, helped, I, you, I, helped, I, me you helped me along. You did. <laughs> but I, I had needed all the help I could get. And I learned from so many great announcers like yourself. But I went to uh, Hawaii and got the job at KMPC doing men's Hawaii basketball. Mm. Uh, a lot of people over in Hawaii were not happy about taking uh, having a woman take a job from a man doing men's basketball over there. But it was a small enough market where I could learn and make mistakes. And it also was the beginning of ESPN. And ESPN really didn't have a lot of women that knew the game. So I knew softball, I knew volleyball, I knew track and field, and I knew, you know, basketball. So they hired me. And then uh, when I went to Chicago with Donnie, um, when he was working for the White Sox, I would work for their sports network. And I did, I did men's and women's basketball. I did football sideline. I did wrestling. I did tennis. I did uh, volleyball. I did, you know, a lot of other sports. Uh, in softball, I did baseball. Weren't you on every network at least once, Andy? <laughs> huh? Well, what was a prime ticket when it first started here in California? Yeah. So I, you were I, ABC, was, CBS, NBC. I'm, CBS, I worked yeah. for them all. <laughs> yes, you did. You did very well. Um, okay, we're switching out of what you just talked about. Uh, you become an NBA tryout player if we can call it that they signed you to a free agent contract and you were the i think the only woman ever to try out for an nba team has that ever been challenged i mean did anybody come after you that tried out well you know first of all i think it was in 69 that denise long was drafted by the uh warriors but the the league nullified that hmm. so lucia harris in 1977 was drafted, and I can't recall what team Lucia Harris out of Delta State was drafted, but Lucy was already, um, you know, she was starting a family and everything and was not, had just come off the Olympics, and so I think she was done playing basketball, and uh, so it was a free agent rookie camp. Um, as I said, I knew a lot of people in the NBA, and uh, I'd be a fool not to admit that publicity was involved. I didn't do it on my part, but um, it certainly received a lot of attention. Sam Nassi came in as a new owner and lived in Beverly Hills. And uh, Slick Leonard was the coach, Bob Leonard, who we just lost, unfortunately. Um, a good guy, but he came from a generation that was like, no, women are not going to play with men. Yeah. And so he came out to California several times and talked to me on the phone several times from Indiana, trying to talk me out of it. And I went back to high school. I went back to high school five years before and thought all these people talked me out of playing and I wasn't going to let it happen again, no matter what. And it was the best I was ever prepared to play the game of basketball, mentally, physically, emotionally. And uh, my brother Jeff helped me train uh, when I got to Indiana early. Uh, Johnny Davis, who was on the team, he helped me work out. He was a good friend from the Pan Ams uh, in 1975. But they had me go to New York and do several talk shows, which I'm thinking, what? I'm sitting in a hotel room. I didn't like it. I'm sitting on an airplane. I didn't like it. I had to be interviewed. I didn't like it. I wanted to work out. I wanted to be ready. Uh, as a matter of fact, the first press conference in Los Angeles, which I didn't know what a press conference was, <laughs> and I was very uncomfortable, uh, certainly going through UCLA and being with David and Papa and everything. Uh, a lot of the media was always very kind to me. But when this press conference happened, I was really attacked and didn't understand and, and didn't know why. Oh, you, you got some horrible questions at media conferences <laughs> from reporters. I saw some of those and it was just ridiculous. In fact, at one of them, you said to, to the guy, that's a silly question. <laughs> <laughs> just like, yeah, none of it made sense because again, for me, I'd always been playing basketball and what I was doing was nothing different. I played with my brothers. I played with his friends. I played pickup games with Marcus Johnson and David and, and Mark Eaton and Wilt Chamberlain and, you know, all the guys that would come out to uh, Poly Pavilion or, or the men's gym. And you'd play pickup games all the time, Mike Warren and so forth. And, oh, yeah. uh, you know, a lot of guys that came out. So uh, what I was doing was nothing different. Uh, certainly I called David and told him about it. Uh, David was supportive, but he was cautious. Yeah. 
yeah. uh, because he knew what it was like to be on the road in, in the NBA. Yeah. And if you look back at it, Ross, too, it's not so much whether I made the team or not. It's, and, and you know, of course, the rules are different today. What do they, they carry 15 guys and you have the G League now. And actually you can carry 17 guys going into the playoffs. Mm. Back in the 70s and 80s, you could only carry 11 guys. And there mm. was no G League. I don't even know if the D League existed at that time. No. But it's only 11 players. So you knew that 9th, 10th, 11 players, how many minutes did they get in a game at yeah. all? Yeah. And uh, so I would have been sitting the bench. So yeah. in not only in sitting the bench, but what would the wives say? What would the girlfriends say? What would the media in, be in, uh, insinuating? What yeah. would other players from other teams say? Hey, what's she like? You know, that kind of thing. If there was a late game and we all got together for you know, a late dinner or whatever afterwards at a hotel and we're all, you know, six of us sitting there. What are the innuendos that people were going to say? That's what I had to deal with. Not so much about what happened on the basketball court. It's about what other people were saying. How long were you with the Pacers and tryouts? Did you ever get to exhibition games? No, I didn't. And I was disappointed at that and frustrated. And I'm sure Slick Leonard had already had it in his mind this was going to only go so far. Jack McCloskey was an assistant at the time who was the GM for the Detroit Pistons when they all won all those championships. And he said, fundamentally, I was better than half the guys out there. Yeah. So it was a free agent rookie camp and they don't have those anymore. You have to be invited to these camps now. And, uh, but certainly at that time, it was th- uh, we had two practices a day for three days. And so how were you going to fare? And certainly I'm sure emotionally I was, I was pretty shook, I'm sure, a lot of times. And, uh, but I, again, I'm very proud of the way I presented myself. I didn't go in there to write a story or to write a book yeah. or to, you know, have publicity about me. And I think that that's why people kind of scratched their head because you knew me. I wasn't like that. That's yeah. not why I did it. And, and still even have to explain it to people today. You're kind of like, what, you know, I had an opportunity and most men don't get that opportunity. So if you get it, are you supposed to turn it down? Yeah. So I Bob, said, yes. Leonard, Bob Leonard said, he said, you know, Annie had the skills, but not the size. She was five feet, nine inches and 134 pounds. And his words, if she had been six inches taller and 40 pounds heavier, it would have been a different story. Well, I know Charlie Chris was playing at the time and Charlie was five, seven, five, eight. And uh, I think, um, you know, Spud Webb was yeah. also just come in. And you think about different guys that have come in at, at the size that they've been under six foot playing the game. And it doesn't matter sometimes, no matter what the job is, whether it's sports or anything else, when somebody wants you, they'll bring you on not just whether it's your skills, but something draws you to make you a part of that team um, in corporate America. Somebody will create a job for you if they feel how important you are and could be to that position in their, in their job. And, um, you know, so I, I appreciate Slick's comments, absolutely. But in not making that team, again, it opened the door for me to broadcast. Sure. I was the first woman to broadcast for the NBA doing the Indiana Pacers. It opened the door for me to get out in the community and understand public relations and community service. And uh, I was with them for about two and a half months. And I was still young and wanted to play and in great shape. And so they released me from my contract so I could sign with the New Jersey Gems and play in the WB- WBL. Your brother, Mark, was your agent, and he made you a heck of a deal with the Pacers. I think you had a guaranteed three-year contract at $150,000. He did, and I blew it because I only signed a one-year deal at $50,000, and uh, and it was not guaranteed. So um, Mark had worked out a great contract, and uh, I just, you know, I didn't know the ins and outs of of all that stuff. And uh, business-wise, as a matter of fact, the way the contract was written up, was that every time I did an appearance, which normally you would get paid for, that money went back into repaying the, the Indiana Pacers hmm. for my contract. So I actually lost money. And then when they released me from my contract, I didn't 
get more than half the, the, the contract. And uh, same thing with the, pay, uh, the uh, New, New Jersey Gems. When I signed my three-year contract, that was a three-year $145,000 contract. And when they didn't pay me all my money from the first year, and then they folded, I lost mm -hmm. all that money. Was the uh, first time you were on the air uh, doing basketball, radio or TV, was that the Pacers job? or before? You, it was with you. No. Yes, it was. That was the very first time. Wow. Nice. <laughs> That's what I said. Wow. <laughs> I can go around and tell, tell everybody that I was going to start a new career, right? Okay. Let's see now. Um, I don't want you to get modest with me, okay? How many halls of fame are you in? I, I don't know. Tommy Lasorda and I used to have this look at, uh, discussion, and Tommy said, I'm in more Hall of Fames than you. And he'd get in another one. He said, I'm in more Hall of Fames than you. And uh, um, just they just created the um, Cal Southern California Basketball Hall of Fame. Yeah, and uh, so I was, they, they had to postpone it because of COVID last year. Yeah. And so they had their first vote, and I was in that inaugural class. Um, and then they had their second vote and David's in that class. So well, um, David and I will be going in let together. Me, let me give you my count. With, with, that <laughs> with that addition, you were in 12 all the way. 12. 12. Can you count them all? It knocked you off the camera. I know, I'm but sorry. Here you are, here you are a few years ago and you were inducted into the Southern California Sports Broadcasters Hall of Fame. Very proud of that. I, I, I really am fortunate and proud of the work that I've done in broadcasting. And, and so many people have helped me like you and, and uh, Keith Erickson, or Keith Erickson, Keith Erickson has, Keith Jackson, uh, Dick Enberg, um, Al Michaels, you know, so many Southern California people. And uh, Mike Breen, I've had the chance to work with Mike Breen and Terry uh, Gannon. And just, I mean, I've had the good for Robin Roberts, uh, Beth Moen, Michelle Tafoya. There's just so many good announcers along the way that I've worked with. But, um, you know, that, that, that meant a lot to me because being growing up in Southern California and hearing all those voices and, and reading all those articles in Southern California during that time, you know, the 60s and 70s and early 80s was a great time for, for uh, sports in Los Angeles. Yeah. Um, not just professionally, but also, you know, certainly with the college sports. But I worked with Tom Harmon. Um, yeah. Just, uh, just the great names that just keep popping up, but Annie, uh, that, that Annie, meant a lot to me. Annie, I've always said that to me, the city of Los Angeles had the best sports announcers of any city. Vince I Stone, agree. Dick Hearn, I, Bob I never Miller, worked with on yeah. and on. Yeah, Vinny, I never worked with Vinny. You and Donnie have, but um, yeah. you know, just uh, another great voice that was always out there. Well, let's see, of those Halls of Fame, Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame, that's the big one, International Women's Sports Hall of Fame, Women's Basketball Hall of Fame. You, they named now the Women's College Basketball Player of the Year in your honor, which is tremendous. You also made the John Wooden all-time All-American team, and uh, those were special days. Uh, going to the Wooden Awards was what really was, and it, it started Marcus Johnson's senior year, and he and I were together, and uh, I, I think uh, going to those dinners, I went because of Papa, but also, uh, you know, Tommy Hawkins and Sam yeah. Logano were the yeah. MCs, but but Hawk was, you know, oh, just wonderful. to listen to his Notre Dame oh, days wow. and, and his know, rebounding and the LA Hawk days. And I, Hawk and I were together. Yes, you were. were. Channel 4, the the Dodgers. We had great times together. And we had we had uh, the Pac-12, a Pac-10 at one time. He and yep. I did it on a Saturday afternoon. And uh, he, he was very special. Um, you wrote a book. And the book is right here. And I want you to tell everybody before I show it. It's the most clever title to a book that I think I know. <laughs> the title. You Let Some Girl Beat You? <laughs> you let some girl beat you did you hear a father say that to his son after you beat him i i hear it all the time today which is sad when so when i was playing on the boys high school team 
in uh, in between my junior and senior year summer league. And in the seventies, you know, the boys were starting to grow their hair really long. Uh, and I have always had short hair. Uh, so you would hear parents in the stand saying, which one's the girl, which one's the girl. And you're going to let a girl beat you. <laughs> so, uh, you know, which is sad to hear in the sense that, you know, they're, they're not saying very much about their daughters, you know, it's almost like they're demeaning their, their sons saying that, that females are not good. Yeah. And uh, it's bad to be compared to a woman or, or a girl. So you let some girl beat you still stands today when you hear it, not only in sports, but in the business world. Yeah. Well, I want to just quote first page of the book. Bill Russell won the NBA championship with the Boston Celtics, a record 11 times. He said, Annie was one of the greatest players ever. I didn't say male or female. I said ever. Julius Irving, uh, one of the most influential basketball figures of, of his generation. I, he's the only guy I think who was the MVP in both the ABA and the NBA. He said, Annie always stayed one step ahead of the competition in terms of preparation. It made her strong on the courts, and it's what makes her so strong as an executive today. And finally, Jamal Wilkes, who was a great start at UCLA, was on two national championship teams with John Wooden, and then um, went to the uh, NBA, and uh, he's in a Hall of Famer, too, also. He said Annie was the only woman to sign a no-cut contract with the NBA. She was mad good, and she had so much heart that it didn't matter what size she was. Wonderful. All very complimentary, all very dear friends. Uh, Julius is like a, a, a big brother to me. Uh, I've known Julius for over 40 years, and Bill Russell and John Havlicek were my idols growing up. Yeah. I mean, I love the Celtics of those days, Sam Jones and Casey Jones and um, you know, Tom Sanders, Satch Sanders, but, you know, Bill Russell was just so smooth. And, and then for him to become a friend, I first met him at the Goodwill Games broadcasting. Uh, he and Rick Barry and, and I were doing the, the basketball for uh, Turner for the Goodwill Games. And uh, so, so Bill's become a dear, dear friend even now. As a matter of fact, I just talked to his wife today and I, they're supposed to be in California sometime in the next couple of days that I'll probably meet up with them. And, uh, and he's still competitive. We play board games or Yahtzee or something, and Bill just laughs when he gets Yahtzee or something, and he beats you, but he's so competitive still. And, you know, it was a great time, too, because, you know, I had the good fortune of meeting Will Chamberlain through track and field because he had Wilt's Wonder Women. He had a bunch of sisters. Yeah. He loved women's sports and, and volleyball. And um, he asked me to join Wilts Wonder Women. And, and uh, he also became a, a dear friend in the sense of not only playing pickup games with them, but uh, we played a lot of uh, 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 racquetball together. And he was, but, great at, he was great in track and field too, wasn't he? He was a great athlete. Both Bill Russell and, and Will Chamberlain were great athletes. They really were. But you remember the athletic department at UCLA, that, um, which is now the J.D. Morgan Center, where they had the, uh, the handball courts down below the offices yeah and uh he and i used to play racquetball all the time wow well also in 1979 you were invited along with the other well-known female athletes to compete in what was called the women's superstars competition which aired on abc now there were events such as softball throwing cycling rowing swimming and running events, which was the toughest one for you? Uh, well, again, you had to do seven events out of the 10 that they gave you in two days. And, um, you know, the obstacle course was pretty easy for me. Uh, swimming, I wasn't that great a swimmer, but I did okay. Uh, tennis, I was good. Um, the running, I ran track, but, uh, you know, when you're running heats and then you have to run again. So I would probably say the cycling yeah. because you had to run the quarter mile right after that. 
Yeah. And uh, I wasn't a great, you know, cyclist. So you had to go around the track on an 800. But and then we did heats. And then so you had a heat, you had the race, then you had a heat in the race. So and in the sun, it was, uh, you know, I'm not making excuses. I mean, I got beat. Know. Put it that uh, way. I got beat. What about rowing? How did you get? I, I did rowing the second year because I wasn't as um, familiar with it and didn't think I was as strong. So a friend of mine, Monica Velka, who was on my uh, one of my USA teams, she played at Long Beach State. She became a rower and tried out for the 84 team. And so when I tried out for the second uh, women's superstars uh, that I won, she helped me on the rowing. Yeah. Well, you won not one, not two but three years in a row, and then you retired to give somebody else the chance, I guess. <laughs> you were the first woman, and I think you mentioned this earlier, the first woman to be invited to the men's superstars competition. Now, I want to make certain that this next story I tell is true. So bear with me. One day during that competition, you had some free time, and you saw your mother talking to a man that you thought was Don Meredith, the retired Dallas Cowboys quarterback. But it wasn't. It was another fellow named Don, Don Drysdale. When you were introduced to him, I'm told, he knew who you were, but you had no idea who he was, nothing about his baseball career, nothing about him as a sportscaster. Did your mother know who he was? Well, as a kid, you know, we didn't really follow baseball that much. Um, and my brothers were all big Giants fans. David was a huge Willie Mays fan. But um, so it was the very first women's superstars. And they had lost my luggage. And mom, I had invited mom to come down to the Bahamas to be my guest. And so we had walked to the wardrobe room so I could get, you know, the clothing uh, for the competition. And we walked in and, and these two guys are there, Bob Euchre, who broadcasts for the Milwaukee Brewers and Don Drysdale, uh, who played for the Dodgers. And so mom knew who Bob Euchre was. And I knew who Bob Euchre was only because of the uh, commercials, commercials, you know, and uh, less billing and yeah. <laughs> the Euchre seats and so forth. So um, so I recognized who Bob Euchre was. I didn't know him. And uh, certainly Don, great looking guy and so forth. But I. I really didn't know who he was. And um, uh, mom started a conversation with Yuki. And, uh, and then he introduced Don to my mom and I and so forth. And um, so we kind of struck up a conversation. I didn't really talk that much. My mom did. And, uh, and then I got my clothes and we left. So that's kind of how we met. But I really didn't know who Don was. How soon after that did he ask you for a date? Well, actually, so it was a two-day competition. We were down there three days. Then ABC had a final dinner, you know, production dinner with everybody. And so Donnie invited mom and I to go to the dinner. Uh, mm. And I'm thinking, how come no other athletes are going? Uh, so Mark. mom and I went. Mark. I wasn't, yeah, I wasn't feeling, well, again, I'm so naive. But um, I wasn't feeling that great. I think I had gotten sunstroke because being in the heat and uh, in the com competition, but um, mom had a great time. I mean, the three of them were drinking and, and telling stories and playing the piano and, and uh, telling uh, uh, the cowboy stories. Uh, you know who the cowboy is. And, um, and I was drinking my seven up. <laughs> and, uh, so um, that's kind of how it all started. And then, and then uh, the next day he asked me, how would you like to go to dinner? And I'm going, uh, I and I had an extra day. So uh, I stayed over and had dinner with him. And literally that night, he goes towards the end of dinner. He goes, what would you do if I asked you to marry me? Wow. And I'm, going, I'm sitting there, Ross, going, I don't know who you are. And I think you're married. <laughs> so, I, you know, I was very uncomfortable. But he was so sure of himself and, and but so polite about it. I think that that's the one thing I always remember. He was such a gentleman. Yeah. And uh, never overstepped his boundaries or anything. But, you know, the, the, obviously the, the friendship grew and the relationship grew because when I got back to New Jersey and, and was finishing out the season, he'd call me uh, a lot of, during the week and we would just talk about nothing. We'd talk about sports. We'd talk about competing. We'd talk about games. And, um, you know, we, we'd just probably, talk. Probably politics, too, if I knew him. 
<laughs> I think he kept that away from me a little bit. <laughs> well, now is it kind of a long distance romance? Because you you and Don didn't get married until seven years after you met. Well, again, he was still married. I was uncomfortable with the situation. My folks had gone through a divorce. I had seen what my mom had gone through. Um, I just, I wanted to keep it on a, a even keel friendship situation. Cause I knew a lot of guys that, you know, again, uh, going back to Julia serving, as I said, I knew Julius from 19, I think I was a sophomore, freshman or sophomore at UCLA. And I had been invited to play in a tennis tournament every year in, in uh, Vegas called the Doers uh, Tennis Competition. There were only about a handful of women that competed, Wilma Rudolph, another one of my idols that I got to know and become a friend with. And Lieberman was there and uh, Susie Chaffee was there, Donna De Verona. So again, there were only about five of us. And, uh, and then it was all baseball players and, and uh, basketball players. And so I, I got to meet Joe DiMaggio oh. and uh, Hank Greenberg became a dear friend. Um, certainly, I, I, and Julius, and uh, meeting all the other different people there. So, uh, when the so I was friends with all these guys, and they had their wives and their families and so forth. And I, I just looked at it like brothers, and I kind of looked at it that way with Don too. I mean, the fact that we were having, you know, just great conversations. He wasn't intimidated by me, and I think also I'm sure he thought it was great that I didn't know who he was. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, sometimes you go through things where you're in the prime of your comp competition and people are all over you because you're out there in the public so much. And I believe me, I'm very grateful we didn't grow up in, in the social media days. Yeah. And um, but, yeah, it became um, not right away, but it became uh, certainly more than just friends. And uh, I think uh, he was in the process of, you know, separating and splitting anyways and uh, from what I heard from other uh, players that he had played with and wives that he knew uh, so they knew it was you know kind of a difficult situation for him but um, it wasn't good for a long time and you know he finally got divorced and he kept asking me to marry him and I thought I don't want him jumping into another situation um, how dumb was I <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah well, you get married, and as you said earlier, Donnie was uh, announcing for the White Sox. Um, what do you remember when Peter O'Malley offered Don a job with the Dodgers? Well, Donnie didn't, you know, talk about it in the beginning because, you know, he was very close to Jerry Reinsdorf and Eddie Einhorn. Yeah. They became very, very dear friends, and uh, Don was very appreciative. He had been working for the Angels before that. And certainly, I think uh, being with the White Sox and working with Ken Harrelson and, you know, it, it was a chance for Donnie, I think, too, to be the guy. He was the guy doing play by play. And, and when he was in L.A., he was working with Enberg and, um, and Dave Niehaus. So uh, but he was the play by play guy. And I think that that was a really big plus. And then when uh, Jerry Doggett retired, uh, Peter contacted him. And Donnie, Donnie went to Jerry and, and Eddie, and, and uh, certainly they were very supportive of that because, you know, Don being known in Los Angeles, but his parents were still out in Los Angeles, and his daughter was out here, and, uh, you know, family is important to him. Um, Hall, of fame, Hall of Fame with the Dodgers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but uh, that last year in um, 86 is when uh, we got married, and then DJ, Don Jr., was born on his birthday, and Don always talked about uh, which a lot of ball players from the, the 50s and 60s said, you know, Mickey Mantle made the famous quote, you know, I should have never named my son Mickey Jr. <laughs> and Don, Don held true to that. He always yeah. talked about that. But when, when Don Jr. was born on his birthday, 51 years later, it was kind of hard not to call him Don Jr. Yeah. And, uh, but he goes by DJ, as you well know, and uh, I call him Donnie sometimes, but um, you know, uh, certainly he's very proud of, of his children, all four of them. Annie, I don't want to burden you, but uh, with your permission, may I ask a couple of things about the, what it had to be the worst day in your life, July 3rd, 1993. Uh, Don was found in his hotel room in Montreal. Uh, then and I were told only 15 minutes before game time that night and instructed not to say anything on the air until you were notified and you were at the beach uh, celebrating Don's daughter Kelly's 34th birthday. And Peter O'Malley 
was the one who gave you the horrifying news. And he said, uh, Annie, Don, Don had a heart attack. I think you said, I got to be with him. And Peter said he didn't make it. Um, were you aware Don had a heart problem? Yes. I mean, he had had angioplasty back in 89. And, um, you know, Frank Job was his doctor and Mickey Melman. And uh, I think that um, if you recall, I think that that spring training, there was a lot of, lot of uh, rain in Southern California in the, uh, um, you know, spring training during that time. And so he didn't get out to get his full physical, which I was not aware of. And I thought that they would have done it in a training camp over in Vero Beach. But um, he came home, I don't know whether it was a couple weeks maybe before uh, he had had, um, his, one of his eyes was kind of bloodshot. And I said something to him and he said, oh, I just ran into you know, a pole or whatever. Yeah. And you know how Donnie could deflect things. Donnie just did not make things about himself. Yeah. Um, but as you said, you know, I had talked to him that night. You had said that you had gone up in the elevator with him um, with your ice creams. And uh, but I had talked to him that night, uh, which was, you know, again, getting ready for Fourth of July and so forth. And I had the three kids and I was at my mom's house with all three of them. And we were going to drive to Manhattan Beach where his daughter Kelly lived and uh, spend the day with her and he was adamant about did, did you get flowers for her did you get a gift for her did you you know and he was constantly you know wanting to make sure that everything was taken care of and I said yes it's all done all done and we talked to each other when he was on the road probably at least a dozen times during the day no in the evening, at least and um je and he'd call and say hi but you know that morning when I didn't get a phone call uh and certainly we didn't have cell phones at the time uh, he did not call. I must've called him three times that morning. And my mind was thinking, well, this is unusual. This is not like him, or maybe he met somebody in Montreal, typical, you know, another ball player, somebody, some other coach or whatever, or he's helping a ball player, which he always was. He was always helping somebody else. And then when, you know, I, I didn't hear from him. And so it was just, you know, kind of laying there that something wasn't right. And so we got to Manhattan Beach. We drove out from La Habra to Manhattan Beach. And, and Kelly had not been near the phone. She'd been out watching volleyball and so forth. And I ran into her and she took the baby. Drew was only about three months, our daughter. And I took the boys that were five and three at the time. And I took them out to, uh, out to the beach. And, you know, I still, again, it just weighed on me that he not called or I hadn't heard from him. And, um, and we were out there a long time. It was almost such a perfect day. And so we didn't get back to the, her apartment till late. And that's, you know, again, I think you had you guys gone on air. I can't remember whether you had gone we on air. We were on the air and we were told not to do anything. And it was the But it was the, the story was, the was eighth, leaking. It was the eighth inning before they said, now you can make the announcement, of course. Yeah, and the story made... was leaking. It was getting out there. And I, I, I know that you know, you guys were like, well, we've got to say something. And, uh, but Peter was adamant about, you know, until he found me, I think he was able to, I don't know whether he got a hold of Don's mom and dad or not. Um, but there was, but never, yeah, he, there was never any doubt that we weren't going to say a thing until we knew you had been notified. Yeah. Good, but, yeah. And yeah. It, it didn't really sink in. It was hard. It was hard. <laughs> That's all I can say. Still hard. At that time, Don Jr. or DJ, as we all call him, was three weeks away from being six years old. Darren was a month and a half from his fourth birthday. And Drew Ann was one week before her four month birthday. Today, they are 34, 31, and 28. And thanks to the way you raised them, without Don, it is quite likely your greatest accomplishment. I think Don would be, I know, Don would be extremely proud of how you shaped his children's lives. And uh, it's just been just magnificent to watch you as a mother. No, well, I hope so. He's been with me every step of the way. Sure he has. And one thing that I, I'm sure is true, you put no pressure on your children to be Hall of Fame athletes like their mom and dad. No, I just wanted them to enjoy the game, whatever they chose, but it's interesting, so many other people put the pressure on them and uh, for them to be perfect, to be, 
you know, oh, you're not as good as your mom, you're not as good as your dad. And, uh, you know, I think that, that weighed with them. And so it's unfortunate that they didn't get to, you know, I think enjoy the, the games as much as they would have liked to. Mm -hmm. Well, now they come out, I know at Dodger Stadium a couple of years, they threw out ceremonial first pitches. Uh, Drew Ann sang the national anthem. How many stadiums has she sang the national anthem in now? She's got a beautiful voice. No, well, thank you. She, thank goodness she takes after her father. <laughs> and uh, and Darren's got a great voice too, but uh, certainly the Dodger organization has been great to us. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy that the kids have found their niche and who they are and what they enjoy to do. And yeah. uh, that's what's been important. But yeah, she, uh, she still loves to sing. Another wonderful trait that you have is caring for people. I cannot count the number of times that my wife, Lynn, and I receive a card in the mail from you. Usually it's not a birthday wish or acknowledging a wedding anniversary. You may simply say, how are you doing? Haven't talked to you in a while. Or, Ross, I enjoyed your interview. Um, another great accomplishment for you, the way you treat people. Well, I think that that comes from my mom and how she was always had an open door. Um, and my dad, my dad was such a great writer. And I, I just feel that, you know, I know we live in a day of social media and, and texting and so forth, but um, I think getting something in the mail, a card or whatever may, means more. Yeah. Well, my dear, have we missed anything? The, <laughs> Lynn will know. Special Olympics. Lynn ah. just interrupted me. Special Olympics. You've been very, very active in that, as was our late friend, Rayford Johnson. Well, and again, it comes from UCLA. I mean, UCLA has really, really helped shape me and the people that I've met. And uh, certainly knowing Mac Robinson, uh, Jackie Robinson's brother. Yep. And, uh, you know, out of Pasadena and an Olympian, but um, being able to know Rayford Johnson in 1975 to be involved with Special Olympics there at Pauley Pavilion and the Drake Stadium, knowing Ducky Drake, uh, but ja and um, Jackie Joyner Kersey, uh, you know, three great people that uh, really have developed the track there at UCLA. But, you know, Rayford and Betsy became such dear friends. And then Jenny and Josh going to UCLA and Jenny's kids now they're you know her daughter's in college now Jaden and um but you know Betsy and, and Rafer have been so special to me and and when I did receive the athlete of the year my senior year at UCLA Rafer presented it to me yeah. uh which is one of the highlights of you know being at UCLA just doing anything with Rafer and Betsy and and they took Drew under their wings uh when Drew was at UCLA and uh, so did Jim Bush, but uh, Rafer and Betsy have always been there for my kids. And as Papa has, Coach Wooden, and, and so many other people that have been involved with UCLA. Yeah. Well, I am so happy and grateful that you gave us the time today to, to have this chat. It's just been uh, a great thing. Thank you. Ross, you are on your game. You haven't lost <laughs> a beat. Thank uh, you for having me. Hey, enjoyed it. I hope to see you soon. We send our love to you and the kids. God bless you and Lynn and the family. Thank you, Annie. Ann Myers Drysdale, our guest today, and I hope you enjoyed it. Beautiful. It went by too fast. Beautiful. One hour. Uh